All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Great Lakes Permaculture Design Collaborative Podcast. I'm Milton Dixon, and I'm here with William Faith. And I'm Rhonda Baird. And we've been getting together as a teaching collaborative across three states. The podcast is there to answer a lot of questions while also inspiring a deeper level of inquiry. To bring ideas and information to people as they're exploring permaculture and implementing it. So, welcome glpbc.info. So welcome everyone to uh, another episode of GLPBC podcast. I'm Milton Dixon and I'm here with Rhonda Baird and William Faith. We're here today to talk about permaculture in action. My thinking behind that is that permaculture is a process and it deeply involves the world around us. So in order to begin to interact with the world around us, you have to go out into the world and do things. And that's really the bottom line of it. And what I'm really wanting to do with this is spur people to do stuff. I think there's a lot of information out there. You can drown yourself for days in permaculture movies and end of the world movies and planetification movies. And if you don't make your way outside, it's, it really doesn't do a single thing if you don't start interacting with the world and starting a relationship with the world. That's maybe what it boils down to. So here we all are in the midst of quarantine. And so I want to think about just things that we can do to start a relationship with the world around us that maybe didn't exist before. So what do you guys say if we just take turns thinking of ways to kind of step off into the great void and meet the other? I think I'm going to start with taking walks and something that I've done in a lot of different places. And it really starts to change your image of what's around you. Because if you don't see it, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, something that I really appreciated from my teachers was advice to harvest something every day. I like to stick things in my mouth like (laughs) when I'm walking around and violets are particularly good this time of year. You know, fall, uh, winter is crab apples. Mm-hmm. Those are pretty good. Yeah. I just actually yesterday stuck a basswood leaf in my mouth. Uh-huh. You know, it's was translucent. That? It was really good, actually. I'm kind of surprised at how kind of meaty it is, how much like depth, you know, to it it has. Kind of like nettles. Have you ever eaten those? Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they kind of have a depth to them. Mm-hmm. So... For me, I think um, taking a leaf from an earlier uh, page in our book is finding a sit spot Mm -hmm. and just observing and uh, being out there listening for urban wildlife, listening for birds, just getting the the hum of the city and what's going on nearby. There's a lot of things that will emerge that were not obvious previously, but if you can sit in silence and really, really use your senses, you'll find that you connect with the spot that you're in a lot more. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to say the leaf, but also the sit spot too, is like if you repeat the same activity over a few days or longer, you'll start to notice the differences. So like a newly emerging leaf will taste different than a leaf that's been out for a little while. And with sit spots, you can see changes or, or patterns you didn't see before. Yeah. So those are great ways to connect. What are sit spots that you guys have or even would want to you know because because if someone's listening and like oh a sit spot what does that mean i mean i can think of some myself so i have a little stool out in my garden and i just go out there and i'll sit sometimes just for five minutes Uh, i go for a walk and i come home and i sit and i just that's like the sunny spot in the yard and it's pretty nice so yeah i if it's raining i sit on my front porch (laughs) and if it's not um i'll sit on the uncovered back porch or I'll sit, um, I have a fire space. I'll sit there, sort of bounce between the three. Yeah. In my old place, we had a deck, a second story deck, and it was really not used all that often. And that's where my garden was as well. So that was the spot that I used to use it quite a bit. And this new place that I'm in, I'm still looking for one, but Pulaski Park is a couple of blocks away. So that's Mm. probably where I'm going to wind up going. Mm. Not that they're the most desirable places, but any good alleys, any good like kind of nooks or even friendly trees out in the parkway. 
Mm-hmm. Those are all good places to, to go. Mm-hmm. We put bird feeders up and I have like a preteen, almost teen and a teen. <gasps> and I think the birds are out eating them. All these nesting birds, all these pairs are coming to feed. And like there's one feeder we're filling up like every other day. They are hitting it so hard. But we are seeing species, but we know that we have, you know, things that are pretty common that are nesting in our area. And then we have seen a few things come in that we've never seen before, Mm. just because we've been consistent. So it's pretty fun. In our last place, we put up squirrel feeders too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There are plenty of squirrels around. Don't need to encourage more. Or there's a skunk. There's a skunk that lives around here. We had two skunks that lived next door at the last place I was in. They'd see them tottering down the alley late at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you start observing, there's just all kinds of things coming through that you just don't even know is there. I remember really, really late one night, we were at the Jewel over off Ashland, and we saw a coyote in the parking lot mm-hmm. around 2 in the morning, walking just straight across the parking lot. Nice. So no shortage of urban wildlife. No. Now they're so adaptable. And I think that that's a good lesson for all of us right now is how can we adapt? How can oh, we use see. permaculture to adapt? Be, how be much flexible. wildlife returning to these public places and you know, during this time, it's been amazing to watch. So oh. per- permaculture in action. So just like harvesting, if I like to harvest every day, I become more invested in sowing seeds or propagating or transplanting or nurturing plants every day if I can. I'm, I'm always uh, collecting seeds mm. and trying to sprout them. It's not always successful. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there's that time in spring when, when a lot of things are coming up and not everything's coming up and you're like, you know, the stratified seeds, so seeds that are like from perennials and stuff that have to sit over the winter. Is that, is that going to come up? What's going on with that? I actually had an Asian pear. That came up and uh, um, uh, some of the blue false indigo that I collected. Mm-hmm. That was pretty exciting. Nice. In our case here, our intentional community project that we've been working on, we've been using the downtime to just really, really focus on and get a lot deeper into stuff that we didn't have time for previously. There was everyone's schedules mm-hmm. was impacting that. And so now that everyone's had the time, we've just been, let's make lemonade. Let's use this time as to our greatest extent possible to kind of move a lot of these things forward. So we've been focusing on that. That's awesome. I think it's this moment where things are not going to be the same as they were before. So what do we want them to be? Like that whole visioning and... How can we influence Mm -hmm. that a little bit? It's a great time to read Mm -hmm. and to think about it and think about your place and think just to think, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's part of sitting is thinking. Mm -hmm. And meditating. And meditating, right? That's all part of it. Mm -hmm. And this is a great time for deep reflection and rethinking, redesigning your place in this and what you want things to look like on the other side. One of the lamentable things is that I think that small businesses are going to be the ones that take the hit primarily. So there's that downside to it, that a lot of the independent and smaller places that we've all become connected to and accustomed to may not survive this. However, if you're trying to silver lining the whole thing and trying to find the opportunity, you know, using that problem as solution thinking, that also does create gaps and creates opportunity for people to come together. I've seen valiant and laudable efforts to try to support these places and try to keep them alive. And in some cases they work and others probably not, but there is opportunity in all of this Mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. What was occurring to me as I was listening to you is that there's the potential when we are individual, we're probably having a harder time, but if we work cooperatively so that we're taking care of ourselves better and our, our risk and reward are changed, it's maybe more doable. It may be a great time for cooperatives to form. Absolutely. Yeah, that's 100% true. And I, I'd like to see a lot more of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been connecting with my neighbors more. The woman two doors down said to me yesterday, do you, do you have enough masks? Do you have masks? And I've had a lot of fun showing off my garlic in my mm-hmm. front yard, prepping people to take it. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. Right. Finding those places where we have access to share. Right. right. And then creating the space and creating the connections because it's a problem to like harvest more than you need and then not know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Trying to cultivate those connections in advance. Mm-hmm. And it's such an easy thing to connect with people over. Food is so central to who we are. And when you can connect with your neighbors that way, you also position yourself as a resource. And that's, for the most part, a good place to be. Occasionally it can rear up on you, but for the most part, you're in service to your community. You know, it's, it's a good place to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I keep thinking, I think we're in for some pretty rough economic times. And A lot of it's the formal economy, like the informal economy is much more resilient, I think. There's a way that, especially like in 2008, and there's the economic contraction a little bit, and, you know, people were getting forced from the economy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, that's kind of what's happening now through different means and different (sighs) mechanisms. But I think that makes the opportunity on the other side even greater, because they're not really going to go anywhere. I mean, where are we going to ship them to, right? Like, that, that's not an option. They're going to be in the community, most likely, mm-hmm. somehow, one way or another. And so how, how do we interact with all these people? How do we bring them together to form new systems that can replace some of the things that even force them out in the first place? Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of our big to-dos as designers, is to look for opportunities to look at these alternative institutions that can perform those same functions that are in service to the greater good that really come to the fore in times of crisis like this, where you can see this informal economy really, really meeting a lot of those same needs. But ownership is of and by the community and subsequently investment in those structures becomes a lot deeper Mm -hmm. and more meaningful. And so this is another opportunity to really try to focus on and develop those things to mm-hmm. the point where, I mean, as much as possible, as much as practical, that we're replacing a lot of those functions with something that's a lot more meaningful and, and has that connective component to it. There's a few larger projects on dozens of acres in my community. And one is a green space farm that's sort of for sale across the road for me. And I, I love it. I love watching the deer and it's like there's some horses in the pasture and things like that and I I don't want it to be built up as condos and apartments and and I'm like oh maybe it won't ever be built up (laughs) now right you know like that's possible yeah Uh, I smell a community land trust forming (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 it'd be perfect so yeah and then I just think about practical things too like not these are practical but concrete things yeah you know um in terms of like practice of permaculture it's sort of like yes community land trust and yes developing regional food hub you know project is kind of stirring around and it's like there's a lot of pieces missing in the food system locally and there's the potential to make it stronger at a moment when it really needs that Mm -hmm. and there's no reason not to step into that gap right now because and every reason to do it. Right. And at the same time in my own home practice with permaculture, processing food, we've been buying a lot of fruit because that's a preference for snack. And we have been buying apples that haven't been eaten. So I'm like, okay, like practical, dry apples, cans of applesauce, whatever, but just those little things that's like, okay, I can't afford to let that waste. Like Mm -hmm. I might have put it in the compost and just said, okay, it's going to go around and become nutrient for the garden. But now I'm even more motivated to make use of it. Right. Like how can I be more frugal with everything that's coming through our system? You're making something that special i mean there may come a point when you know if you don't make it you don't have it there's all sorts of things up in the air with what's going to happen this this year with food yeah there may not be enough to go around i have no idea how it's going to play out right Mm -hmm. there may be you know we may be stuck eating potato chips and it's all it's all that any of us can get wow (laughs) i hope not (laughs) yeah 
but uh it's it's uh yeah yeah, I mean, thinking about Cuba and how, you know, what was the average person lost like 15 pounds? 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Oh, oh okay. More. Yeah. More. Great. You yeah. know, that, that I, could, I could stand to lose 20 pounds, but is that how I want to do it? No. Yeah, I think you'd rather be in choice <laughs> on, on that one. Well, and that's to some extent, like that's kind of what we're talking about too, right? Like, let's start making the choices mm-hmm. so that they aren't made for us. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's positive ramifications of eating whole foods, right? Or eating a better diet by choice and practicing like stress. Like, I think that's another piece is about like we're all feeling anxious because of the quarantine, but also like there's more awareness of stress and self-care around stress and mental health right now than I've seen in a long time. And I'm seeing more people reach out. Mm. And I think, you know, yes, obesity and, and unhealthy foods are bad for Americans health, (laughs) but you know, um, Stress has been huge. So the combination of making more conscious choices around food, spending more time doing self-care, reaching out to people around mental health issues or anxiety, you know, anxiety or depression or grief or whatever it is that around is how us you're in thinking. general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just see a lot of really positive things. And I, to me, that has always been a part of the practice of permaculture. It's not just shovels in the ground digging swales you know i think you guys agree too 100 percent. the social component for me is as you both know that's i always make the argument that that's the bigger part of it and i underline that because whatever design projects you have in mind they all have their grounding in people you know in order to green light these things in order to get them going in order to establish them in order to maintain them your human relationships have to be in check and those things, you know, all those I's dotted, all those T's crossed and, you know, having goodwill throughout is kind of an essential. That's the grease that keeps those gears turning. And so consequently, a lot of the dysfunction I see are in the human relationships area, but in this particular moment in time that we're in, I've been seeing a lot of things that actually make me quite hopeful Mm -hmm. here in Chicago in particular. It's just been, a really heartening and uplifting to see people coming out and saying, Hey, if you're having a difficult time, if you're alone, if you feel isolated, please reach out and posting their phone numbers, or their emails, or just say, mm-hmm. message me directly on here. I've always got time for you. And so a lot of support in that area. And then also equally on the other side of that is people who are having a rough time reaching out and saying, Hey, I'm really feeling alone right now. And then watching just loads and loads of people come forward and saying, Hey, let's talk, let's mm-hmm. connect. And some people doing kind of mental health type gatherings online where they'll connect like this on zoom and, mm-hmm. and uh, similar technologies where they're just holding space for each other. And so these are the things that I think we really need right now. And uh, the need is clear and also the willingness to meet that need is really, really there. So I very much appreciate that. It also underlines a need in the design area for us to be more on top of that and and more cognizant of it and integrate that on a deeper level into our design work. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity just to stop and look around and assess all the things that are going on and an opportunity to take a look at ourselves and say, how can we improve ourselves? What tools can we add to the toolkit? Mm -hmm. They could be skills. They could be physical tools. They could be social tools. They could be supplies and materials. There's a lot of different ways to think about that in a very practical way. How about states of mind Mm -hmm. that we can start to to say, hey, what kind of state of mind am I in if I sit in front of the TV for six hours? All right. Or what kind of state of mind am I in if I spend those six hours making applesauce Mm -hmm. and canning it and putting it up, you know, or walking around my neighborhood? That's a long time to walk around your neighborhood, but. Yeah, my health would be improving and my stress would be less. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. At the same time, I always look at these things when I get some surprise or something surfaces that I wasn't 
looking at or aware of prior to that moment, I always look at that as an opportunity to sharpen my observation skills as well, because there was something that I missed or something that I wasn't paying attention to, and it just sort of popped up and got me. And that's an opportunity for me to step back and say, okay, I wasn't looking at this and kind of broaden that awareness and, uh, and sort of open your view up a little bit. So I always, I always take that as an opportunity to sharpen my observation skills. Yeah. Always look at the stuff you weren't paying attention to. The obvious holes, right? That's what we're trying to do is look, what are we not paying attention to? What's missing? What's here right in front of us and not being thought about at all? Mm-hmm. And those reveal oftentimes leverage points or it's those things that we don't think about that can often have the most change in our lives. Yeah. I think that what I'm hearing in that is a lot of, we've been going through our lives patterned and conditioned by society and our families and we have gotten into ruts. And when we're in these unconscious patterns, the ruts, we just be bopping along doing what we're supposed to. So that incredible opportunity for growth that you were speaking of, William, is something that's, we're all being given that opportunity, right? We're given that opportunity all the time, but it's being brought forward. I really appreciate that you highlighted it in that way. And I think maybe it's the most useful skill. I mean, I would put it in the top three. Like, what am I learning from this? Yeah, that's really cool. And it's something that you get to take along with yourself wherever you go, right? If you've learned something, you know, no matter what happens, you have that in every new situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. To that same end, I think it also underlines the awareness that you're not going to catch everything, that you're not going to, you know, everything that pops up is not necessarily going to occur to you or you're not going to connect with it so that to me underlines the need to work in groups you know to design mm -hmm. with other people because no matter what anybody that you're working with they're going to notice things you didn't and you're going to notice things right. that they didn't but when you put those things together you have a much broader picture you know a much more complete picture and so i've always found that where you can i mean just for in most media example just within the three of us when we sit down and talk about things just like this, you know, each one of us will always pull something out that, you know, the other one or two didn't think of. And it just keys off. I mean, the number of times that I can mention where we get into this really bubbling, you know, conversation over the simplest topic, over the smallest thing, but just so many different perspectives coming into it, it you know, so we'll, one person will tail off on something and the next one, next one's running. It's just the baton keeps passing and, and the circles keep getting tighter and tighter and right. the whole thing keeps moving faster more times than I can enumerate here. But it's always, always wise to involve other people when you can. So I'm just thinking of like, what are some of the main messages I've heard in our conversation? One, just do something, even if it's wrong, do something with as much information and good intention and capacity as you can and then learn from it. So the second thing would maybe be learn from it. And a third one would be don't work by yourself as much as possible. I mean, social distance as needed, but work collaboratively and collectively toward common goals. That would extend even to nature and to the world around us and not even just in the human realm, for sure. That if we can be sensitive enough and receptive and take in all these things, the, the responses to our action. And we can take that as feedback and we can look for those leverage points that, hey, if I just change this a little bit, a whole different thing is going to happen. It's going to be so much better. Yeah, I am finding more joy and peace and hope and love in my relationships these days than I have in a long time, actually. So, feeling the same. Yeah. Pretty fabulous. Yeah. I want to tail in on something you were saying as well, Rondo, when you were talking about, both of you were talking about with just getting out there and doing stuff. I just wanted to underline the don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail fabulously. <laughs> you know, uh, going out and doing something, you know, accept that you, it may not work. You may get it wrong. There may be limited return, mm -hmm. but 
there's nothing wrong with that. That is an intrinsic part of the learning process. And if it's killing a plant, take that opportunity to observe. Maybe you put it in the wrong place. Maybe the microclimate was up. Maybe you planted the wrong cultivar. Look for that feedback and mm -hmm. use it. Don't be afraid of failure. I make more mistakes than I have successes any day of my life. But at the same time, you know, I'm always trying to integrate that feedback and learn from it. So yeah, do Oops. not be afraid of failure. You know, if you can start from the point, like your success or failure hinges on when you make the decision. I'm going to choose this or that. Now that might fail spectacularly, but it doesn't matter because you chose it and you're successful in you know, going down that path. That makes sense. I didn't think I had a green thumb at all until I started in with permaculture. I frequently killed <laughs> many bonsai and houseplants, whether I did that or pets were chewing on things or, you know, hard to say, but kids, I mean, there, I did not think that I could grow food successfully until I got into permaculture. And then I realized plants really want to grow. They want to succeed. <laughs> they want you to succeed. But if I had said, oh, I just can't grow food, like this permaculture thing is kind of cool, but I kill everything I touch and hadn't tried, I wouldn't have realized the success that I have now on a regular basis. And it's not really even me. I just create the context for everything else to do the work. Hear that. Uh, in my early days, I killed more plants than succeeded. In retrospect, looking back, it was through over-management. I was kind of the helicopter parent with the plant. You know, it was over-watering, over-tending, just standing over it and watching it, waiting for it to grow. And, Come on! You know, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was over-management, over whereas I, I learned a lot later. <laughs> just get out of the way. But if I wasn't so dogged and bloody-minded about in my way, I might have been off put off by that but mm -hmm. learn from those mistakes did it better next time but it's important for us to do the thing i really appreciate this opportunity to work with these two folks and one of the things that we get to do together is to put on permaculture design courses so we got a permaculture design course coming up and you can hear more of our banter in our introductory permaculture course. It's a survey of the topics that we cover in the PDC. We took the video cliff notes for most of the sections of the PDC that we created together and put them out to see if they could support people's permaculture learning and journey. So it's free to check out and you can see what every student would see. and. So they're available to you to watch and see if you can gather any new insights from and put that into practice. And if you want to build on that, what you're seeing in the videos, you could join us for our permaculture design course, which starts August 1st this year. And it's And then online. also, if you want to get a sort of uh, condensed version or an opportunity to ask some questions of uh, some of what we do here, um, we are doing a permaculture primer online. Uh, so there's information down in the show notes. So just uh, go look there. There'll be a link for that. And uh, we're doing a 90 minute sort of introductory walkthrough where we can go into some of that information and you get the opportunity to ask questions. So if you can join us for that, that would be great.